Well, we have a special treat this morning that I'm personally very excited about. We have a guest speaker who is here with us. His name is Dr. David Emanuel. I met Dr. Emanuel when I was in seminary uh, several years ago, and I really, really enjoyed his class. I don't I just kind of sat quietly in the back because it was my last semester and I sort of had senioritis. So I don't know if he remembers me or not, but that's okay. That was actually the biggest mistake I made in seminaries. I never took Dr. Emanuel's class until my very last semester because I would have taken more and more. And so he came in January and taught a discipleship class that many of you were at. It was one of the best classes we've ever had. And so we're so thankful that He's here this morning with us on only our second week of public live worship. And so those of you guys who are here in the room, would you join me in a big round of applause to welcome our guest, Dr. David Emanuel. Come. Normally I would shake your hand or give you a giant hug, but it's totally not allowed. But thank you for coming. We sure appreciate it. Thank you very much for for the invitation. Um, Wow, after an introduction like that, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. Um, Thank you very much for turning out. Thank you for coming here. And thank you for the invitation as well to uh, not just to speak. Uh, I enjoy um, speaking and preaching. I haven't done so since the opening up of the COVID era. Um, So it's really good to speak to real people um, and not cubes. This is really something else. And it's going to take me a bit of getting used to. And that's not to say anything um, bad about those who are uh, watching and live streaming uh, this as well. I'm not holding you in any kind of disdain or anything like that. Um, Dr. Emmanuel, I've come, as you, as you no doubt have heard, I am not from around here originally. Um, I'm originally from the UK, from England, which doesn't go down too well. Obviously, a couple of weeks back, celebrating the 4th of July, you've asked the question, well, why are you guys doing this? And they keep telling you why. Um, but we're past that now, and hopefully... You guys have forgiven us for that, right? <laughs> so um, I was born in England, born and raised in London, and, um, and was around about, I lived in London, I was originally a computer scientist, and up until uh, about the age of 34, I think it was, no, 31, 32, I moved to Israel to study, and that's where I did the majority, or more my graduate, my doctoral studies. And I moved to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, Hebrew University, and that's what I uh, I did. I studied Bible there because they told me that was probably the best place to study it. Um, so we spent 11 years. Um, I have five children. They were all born there. Uh, and we, after that, after the graduating, um, my wife and I, who's over here, Emma, we moved back to the UK for two years. And then we were called out to Nyack College, to um, college and, and ATS Seminary, to teach. Um, and that approximately brings us to the year 2020. Who would have thought? Who saw this coming? Virtually a metaphor for disaster. 2020. And I should have known, I should have known something was up after the death of Kobe Bryant. I should have figured this wasn't going to go very well for the rest of the year. And so we have covid Uh, that has hit us. We have a racial upheaval, a stirring, uh, which has come to the fore as well. And perhaps worst of all, we have this uncertainty for the future. We do not know what is coming around the corner. We do not know how we're going to be hit financially. We do not know the repercussions of everything that is going on. So we have this um, uncertainty, this difficult situation which has hit us. And on top of that, we are faced in this day and age, in 2020, now I heard this superlative a couple of weeks ago, and I don't generally like superlatives, but it's true. This is the age, this is one age in which there has never been as much information available to individuals coming towards us. Never. Never. We, can, we have, uh, we're at home, we have the phones, we have iPads, computer screens, television. Information is coming in at an incredibly high rate. And it's pouring in from absolutely everywhere. And with that, we have opinions and views 
of just about everybody coming into our homes, into our pockets, everywhere we go. Opinions, opinions. The police are great. No, they're not. They kill people. Yes, but they have a difficult job. Let's defund the police. Don't be so stupid. We have to have the police with us. Wear a mask. Don't be stupid. Don't wear a mask. It's government control. They don't do anything. Yes, they do. They save lives. Opinion, 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 thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. And it goes on and on. And in the midst is God trying to speak to his church. In the midst is God trying to speak to his church. This challenge, even though it is amplified today, it's something which the prophets knew, the kings knew a long time ago in biblical literature in the Old Testament. I teach a lot of Old Testament. One of the things we don't fully appreciate when we hear Jeremiah speaking before the king, before King Zedekiah, or when we hear um, Micaiah ben Imla speaking to um, the king, king of Israel, we don't realize that the king doesn't just have one prophet of the Lord, but there are hundreds of prophets around them. And the king is in a similar position to, to us today. We have to discern the voice of God amidst everything we have to know what he is saying. This is our calling as a church, to know what he is saying, that we can speak that out to the world. This is our job. If you didn't know that's what you signed up for, I am sorry. But that is what you signed up for. So we have this heavy responsibility to know what is it God is saying to us. And what is it he's saying to us? I don't know. I'm in a similar situation with you. I don't have all of the answers. And if I did, I could never explain it all to you in a morning service. It's tough. It's difficult to know for sure. But I do have some suggestions which I want to share with you today about hearing his word in this particular environment in which we are living. And I want to share those with you today, and most of them are derived from one short passage in the book of Kings, which we're going to look at. I had some slides. I was, I was kind of embarrassed to show them because um, 2020... Twenty twenty. So full of hope, wasn't it? So full of hope. And yet this is where we are. So we need there's one thing we do need to do is we need to find out what God is saying. And we, we go to this passage in the book of Kings. I love the book of Kings um, and love the stories of Elijah and Elisha, the Elijah-Elisha narratives. And we're going to read some of this section here in 1 Kings 19. We're going to read just from 9 to 14, a few verses. Then he came out there to a cave. And just sorry, just to give you a bit of background to what's going on, Elijah has just been up on Mount Carmel and he's just had this massive showdown with Israel and the prophets of Baal, and he has just been able to, um, he thinks, he'll move some way at least to show that God, the Lord God of Israel, is God, and that Baal is nothing at all. And he has this challenge, and in spite of that, in spite of him winning the challenge with the sacrifice and fire coming down from heaven, the people are still not 100% bought into the God of Israel alone. And Jezebel threatens his life, and he has to flee. And he runs. He runs into the um, desert, 
making his way to a place called Chorev, which is also called Sinai, the mountain of God. But on the way, it gets too much for him, and he lies down, and he says, I just want to die. Take my life, Lord. And God sends an angel to revive him, and he is revived, and he goes and continues and makes his way to the mountain of God. And that's where we pick up the story from. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking the pieces, in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. But after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. His story doesn't change. The God of hosts, for the, whole, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenants, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. With the sword, with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. This passage, what's going on here, this is something that we call a theophany. It's a place, a time where a text in which we have God meeting almost face to face an individual to communicate something to him. Usually theophanies occur at the beginning of the ministry, of an individual's ministries. If you go back to the book of Isaiah, we see at the beginning, if you go to the book of Ezekiel, you see at the beginning of his ministry, they have these theophany experiences where they meet with God. But this happens not at the beginning, but for the end for Elijah. For Elijah. And yes, you've probably picked up, there are some similarities between Elijah and Moses, Um, Both of them have this experience on top of the mountain, meeting God. Both of them have to hide in a cave so uh, they're not exposed directly to God as well. And both of them arrive on that mountain in connection with the covenant, although there are two very different reasons. Moses is on the mountain to receive and accept and begin the covenant, but Elijah is in his mind, is he's, he's going up there because he wants to revoke the covenant because he thinks, he believes it has come to an end. So from this text, there are six points, six pieces of advice I would like to share with you. They're not exhaustive. I could add more to them, but I shan't. Six pieces of advice on hearing God in a covid generation in a COVID era. The first one, get away. Get away. Leave the noise. Elijah left the noise of the northern kingdom of Israel. He ran, he fled away. He wanted to speak to God, he wanted to hear God, and he had to flee in order to do it. It is difficult to hear God amidst noise and other voices. Even Jesus, many times in his life and ministry, went away. He walked away to a secluded place, to a deserted place, to listen and to hear God. And that is something we need to do. We need to do. We need to find quiet places where we can stop and listen. 
if we can do it on a daily basis, the quiet room in the house, early in the morning when no one else is around, we need to find the quiet place where we are not as affected. We are not hearing so many other noises or voices. If possible, there are times when I would even suggest that we, we move away from home. We go away and we spend a day, two, three, four days away. Away from normal life, whatever that looks like these days. But we go away to listen and to hear what God is saying. A bit of a luxury, but it's still necessary. And when I speak about getting away, and it's not just about getting away from people so much, it's getting away from Instagram, from Facebook, from Twitter, from television. It's getting away from the news. There are a thousand news channels. All of them argue to be objective and only tell the facts and only tell the truth. We need to take time to get away from that and listen to God and hear God because that's where the facts are coming from. That's where the truth is coming from. So we need to take time to put these things away. A day, you put a day and you say, I'm not going to check any social media. I'm not going to look at anything. I'm going to give this time to you and I'm going to try and hear what you have to say, Lord. People find it usually more difficult to fast from food than they do from social media. That's a stunning piece of information right there. So we need to Take some time to get out and get away from everything that's around us. But we also need to use that time to get into his word. I'm not just saying that because I'm a college professor. I'm not advertising Nyack College here, but it is a great school now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> but we need to take time to get into his word. I know that Elijah knew the word of God because of what he did, he's going to the mountain of God. He knows about Moses. He knows where the covenant was set. And he's going back there to speak to God. He knows and God's word is shaping his life. So when we take time to go away, it's not for an extended fishing trip or golfing, though that would be nice. This is a different time. This is time to get into the Word of God, to spend time reading God's Word. He gave us this wonderful manual, 66 books. He gave those to us, but so often it is ignored. In many of my undergraduate classes, introduction to Old Testament I teach, it is shocking each year, and the number seems to go down and down, how many people have actually read the Old Testament. I am desperately surprised by it. It's given, it's freely available, and yet we are not taking time to read it to know the will of God. It remains useless unless we read. Some words of advice concerning getting into the Word of God. Two pieces of advice concerning that. One of them is this. It does take time and effort. It does take time and effort. You will come across things that you will read and you'll think, oh my goodness, what does that mean? That does happen. But we do have to work through it. We do have to invest time and effort in getting closer to God. And the second thing which is just as important is that it must, we must be familiar with it all. And I'm going to come back to this in a, while, in a while as well. The idea of accessing the whole of God's truth and not just some of it. It's very easy to fall into the pattern of finding five or six pet passages that you go over and over and over again. Your favorite passages and you miss the rest. 
So it does take time and effort, but it does really need to be done. As we sit down and try and hear God's will and know his will in this era, we need to expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. When Elijah went up the mountain, I can, through the way in which the text is written, I can almost guarantee Elijah expected God to appear in the storm symbols, the wind, the earthquake, the fire. Fire particularly, because the last time somebody came up that mountain, God spoke through the fire, which was Moses. So these are the places, certainly as a reader as well, we're thinking, wow, God is going to speak through those things, but he doesn't. He doesn't. And Elijah at least leaves the door open for God to speak to him another way. And so when we are looking to find out what God's will is, it's very important that we leave the door open for him to speak to us in any way that he chooses. It's often very easy for people to fall into the trap and think, well, I like to hear God's word through this preacher or through this news channel or through this website And it's very easy to limit our view and our perspective of how God is going to speak to us and how he's going to teach us. We see in the New Testament examples of this where Jesus does some unexpected things in his teaching. He stops and he uses a widow putting a few coins into the contribution box in the temple and uses that to teach the disciples. He uses a despised ethnic group, the Samaritans, to teach the disciples about being good, about being a loving neighbor. You know, after these lessons, you know, you can see the disciples sitting down thinking, wow, I never saw that coming. A Samaritan helped out? I never saw that coming. He teaches about being born again, something strange for Nicodemus. Nicodemus had already been born again as many times as he possibly could. He could see no more, but Jesus adds one more, something unexpected to teach. We need to be open to the many ways in which God may speak to us. It might be something very different. It might be through our children It might be through circumstances we go out and we see in the garden, out in creation. We need to be open to the many ways in which God speaks to us. So we expect the unexpected, but we must also expect the uncomfortable. The uncomfortable. So often when God speaks, he asks his people to do things which they are not 100% comfortable with. When Elijah went up on that mountain to, to what I believe very much is to revoke the covenant, God turned around to him and basically retired him and said, go, anoint Elisha, your successor. Anoint a new king of Israel, anoint a new king of Syria. He, he retired him. And I don't think this is, was particularly comfortable for Elijah. He wanted to carry on um, with this work or see an end to that covenant. So God's words were uncomfortable to him. We see as well another Old Testament book, the book of Habakkuk. You have to read Habakkuk. Just three chapters, you have to read this book. In it, we find a prophet who cries out to God saying, Lord, how can you suffer the injustice in Judah and Jerusalem? How can you put up with this mess? And then God turns around to him and says, you know something, you're right. And I'm going to punish it by using the most cruel people on earth to come here and overturn the city. And Habakkuk says, 
No, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. He asked for it, and what he got was uncomfortable. He got an answer, but it wasn't quite what he wanted, and it was going to cause discomfort for the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. We have to be ready for that. We have to be ready when we come to God and we say, Lord, you've got to fix this situation. We have to be ready for God to turn around and say, yes, you're right. But first, I want to fix you. We have to be ready for God to turn around and say, hey, David, let me first get this piece of two by four out of your eyes and then we can come to this situation that's before us we have to be ready for the uncomfortable change in our lives so the next thing number five we have to be prepared for the whole truth this is a bit this is this is like one of my hobby horses one of the things I see as a bible teacher When we look at the story of Elijah, Elijah went up to God, to Mount Sinai, with a head full of steam, with half the truth. He went up there saying, Lord, they've killed all the prophets, destroyed your covenant, it's all over. And to a point, he was right. He had half of the truth with him. But when he goes up on that mountain place, God reveals to him the real truth. A little bit further on in this passage, we hear, no, I've actually reserved 7,000 prophets that haven't bowed a knee to Baal. He had the truth. He had half the truth. And he needed more. And this is my, this is my huge hobby horse. Because it's very easy for us to gain half the truth, and to think we have everything. It's very, very easy for us to do that. But our task, as we come to know his will in this age, is to know the whole truth, is to fight and to speak for everything that God stands for. This is particularly close to my heart because I, like I said, as you know, I'm not from the U.S. I'm from England, and so things are done very differently. But it's something I've seen as I've come over here, and that is something I've noticed. I've noticed what I know from Scripture as I look down at Scripture. I read it, and I know that God cares for the unborn child. And I also know that God cares for social and racial injustice. And I also know that God cares for the preservation of the family unit. But when I look up, I see these things split into two camps. Both of them claim to have the truth. And they do. But only half of it. To know God's will is to know everything. And to support everything that is on God's heart, first and foremost. In England, you go before a court of law, they make you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this needs to be our approach to seeing God in Scripture, and to knowing His will. We need to know His truth, His whole truth, and nothing but His truth. And just for the last point I turn to, number six, we have to prepare to press in. This is a message I know that you have heard over the last few weeks, but we have to prepare to press in. In. Elijah's resolve, I think, is a little bit sketchy. He wants to go down to to Mount Sinai. He gets most of the way. 
the road gets too hot, it gets too hot for him, and he lies down under a bush and said, Lord, I just want to die. Take my life. I'm done. And God has to intervene by sending an angel in order to get him all the way to the mountain. So I don't know what his resolve was like, but I know that we do this ourselves. And our resolve is usually on the easier path. The path of least resistance. Very often for us, we tend to chase the happy life as opposed to the holy life. But as we look through Scripture so much, we see that the path that God calls for his saints is so often the more difficult path. So often we find that it is through conflict, through disturbance, that God actually speaks to his people. Famous coach, um, Greg Popovich, you may have heard of him, coach of San Antonio Spurs. One of the things he was saying, I, I heard him say, which was a remarkable, he said he, he prefers talking to his team after a loss than after a victory. Because after a loss, their ears are more attuned to what he has to say. And I wonder if that's true for us, that God prefers speaking to us through distress because our ears are slightly more attuned to what he has to say. I have heard it said, even in this church itself, do not waste a good crisis. Embrace and lean in and press in to every crisis so that you may find out what it is God wants from you. I can't tell you how many times I have heard it said again and again and again. I can't wait until this is over. I can't wait to get back to normal, whatever that is. I can't wait for things to get back to normal. Maybe normal wasn't so good, and God doesn't want us to get back to normal. Maybe he wants to move us on, forwards, through the adversity to something better. The Israelites in the desert, when they faced adversity, they turned back to look at everything they had in Egypt. The fish, the cucumbers, the cumin, the melons, it was wonderful. They looked back to what was normal for them. And God was trying to push them forward to something better. They were fighting for crumbs. He was looking to give them manna from heaven. Maybe that's the situation that we find ourselves in now. If we are prepared to press in, to use this crisis, to use everything that's going on around us to get better, and I'm speaking to the church, so that we can practice more love amongst, in, amongst the congregation, so that we can practice more commitment as a result of what's going on, so we can communicate better amongst this church, individuals in this church, and churches outside, so we can be more dedicated to doing God's will and to serving Him as a people. But in order to do that, we have to be prepared to press in, to move in to what, to what God has put before us to grab our attention. So at this time, as I close, I just want to say that I think God, that there is something deeply uncomfortable about this year, 2020. 
what we are experiencing now is unprecedented in many, many ways. But it is not for us to flee from it, hoping and yearning for it to be gone. Instead, as a church, and I am particularly talking to the church, we need to lean into it to hear what God has to say and how he wants to change, it, change us. Those, are just, those were just six words, just six. Six topics, six ideas that lay down a, frame, a framework or the groundwork for what we all need to do which is strive amidst the noise and the chaos of this world to know God better. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we bless you. I bless you, Lord God, for an opportunity to see real faces, Lord God, and to share the word amongst real faces in addition to those um, live streaming, Lord God. But we bless you for your word, Father. We bless you and praise you as well because you're a God who wants to communicate with his people, Father. So I would pray that even as this week goes by, that you would be opening up new channels and doorways for this church, for individuals, for the leadership in this church as well, to hear your will for them, that they may walk in that faithfully, even as you have called them to do so. And I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.